Hey everyone, welcome in for more proteomics. Believe it or not, this is actually going to be the last set of lecture slides for the whole semester. Kind of sad, right? Well, this lecture is basically going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge of miscellaneous topics that we didn't really get a chance to cover at any particular point in the semester. Still important topics though that we definitely want to make sure that we hit on. And really it's a good time for us to talk about these things because at this point late in the semester we have a much deeper understanding of proteins, protein structure, protein function, that a lot of these topics are going to make more sense now than they would have earlier in the semester. So the first topic that we want to hit on is the use of radioactivity, radioisotopes in protein research. Now to really understand how radioactivity works we first need to understand the concept of isotopes. Now, you learned in general chemistry that elements come in many different forms and what makes an atom of an element unique is that every atom has a unique number of protons and that is absolutely true. What you are looking at here are three different kinds of atoms of hydrogen. Now, what they all have in common is that they all have the same number of protons, one. One proton is what makes an atom of hydrogen an atom of hydrogen. Now, all these atoms of hydrogen do differ in one important way. Now, they all have the same number of protons, but they actually have differing numbers of neutrons. The hydrogen that you are most familiar with, which makes, well over, makes up well over 99% of naturally occurring hydrogen, is called protium. This is hydrogen one. This atom of hydrogen contains one proton and no neutrons. So added together, it has an atomic mass of just one. Then we're looking at the other two isotopes of hydrogen. Deuterium has one proton and one neutron, and tritium has one proton and two neutrons. The definition of an isotope is an atom of the same element that differs in the number of neutrons that it has. So even though all three of these isotopes are technically hydrogen because they all have exactly one proton, they're slightly different from each other in that they have differing numbers of neutrons. So we're going to refer to atoms like this moving forward as isotopes. Now the deal though is that as atoms become more complex, meaning that as we're dealing with atoms that have more protons than hydrogen, we can end up with a lack of stability and that usually stems from atoms having a great imbalance in the number of neutrons compared to the number of protons. The basic idea is that the more neutrons an isotope has, the more likely it's going to be that you are going to end up with a radioisotope, meaning a radioactive isotope. Like I said, this is caused by a great imbalance between the number of protons and neutrons, usually because you have a lot more neutrons than you do protons. This causes the nucleus of that atom to become exceedingly unstable, and that atom, which we will find out here in a little bit, can actually eject excess neutrons uh, such that it releases a great deal of energy. And that energy, that radiation, can be detected in a number of different ways. The picture that you're looking at here is from what is called a PET scan, positron emission tomography, which is something that I actually teach in my human physiology classes. So this is a way of detecting radioactivity that has been introduced into a living patient. In this particular case, this patient that you're looking at here, we're looking at several different uh, angles and slices of this patient. This patient has been injected with uh, radioactive glucose in which the carbon atoms within that glucose molecule have been radio labeled with carbon-14, a heavy version of the usual carbon-12 isotope. Now you're seeing some particular masses within this patient lighting up like a Christmas tree as you can see here. Those are actually cancerous tumors. And the reason why the cancer cells are lighting up whereas uh, everything else is relatively quiet other than the brain for uh, other reasons, the brain is not cancerous in this case, but the reason why these big tumors are lighting up is because cancer cells have a very unique biochemistry. Cancer cells actually use glucose a lot more than the normal cells in the body. So someone was able to figure this out and they figured, okay, well if cancer cells 
uh, utilize glucose a lot more, then we can actually detect cancer cells by injecting someone with radioactive glucose. The cancer cells will hoard all of that glucose and the cancer cells will basically be telling on themselves. They'll be telling the, us exactly where they are. And there are a number of other different medical uh, applications for radioisotopes. This just happens to be one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about nuclear decay and particle emission. Basically, what makes a radioisotope radioactive? I mentioned before that the radioactivity stems from an imbalance between the number of neutrons and the number of protons in the nucleus. So the nucleus is going to become unstable and over time it will decay and emit particles and radioactivity. There are three different types of either particles or emission radiation that can be given off by a decaying radioisotope nucleus. The first is called an alpha particle. Alpha particles are synonymous with helium nuclei. A nucleus of helium contains uh, two protons and two neutrons. So alpha particles tend to only be emitted by very large elements, elements that have an atomic mass of at least 140. Now, if you recall from earlier in the semester, we mentioned that uh, really when it comes to biochemistry, we're only going to be uh, concerned with elements that are much, much, much lighter than that. So these uh, uh, alpha particles are really not going to be of much concern to us in biochemical research. Now, beta particles are much, much, much more commonly emitted particles, and these are going to be much more commonly seen in our line of work when we work with radioisotopes. Uh, beta particles are most commonly emitted. They give off a very characteristic energy signature that can actually be easily identified if you're working with multiple radioisotopes. And then gamma rays are not actually particles, but they are actually very, very, very low wavelength radiation, meaning high, high, high energy. This is very high energy radiation that is given off by these particular radioisotopes. And because it is very high energy radiation, it, it poses very high potential harm to living organisms. So if you're working with a radioisotope that gives off gamma radiation, extreme caution and great care must be taken. But for most cases, we're not gonna be working with radioisotopes that give off gamma rays. Uh, so here is a diagram that kind of gives you an idea for what we're dealing with, with both alpha decay, beta decay, and gamma emission. Beta decay, like we said, is going to be the most common that we work with. Beta particles can either exist as either beta plus positrons, which is also called an anti-electron, Think of an a particle the size of an electron that actually has a plus one electrical charge or the more common beta minus electron. So basically just think of a radioisotope that starts ejecting electrons. And we mentioned that alpha particles are basically just helium nuclei. And then gamma rays actually do not involve a change to the parent radioisotope, but you do end up giving off extremely high energy radiation. Uh, here's a recreated table from your textbook that shows you the energy given off when a particle is emitted. And in the far right column, you can actually see the half-life of that particular radioisotope. We'll touch on what half-life means exactly here on the next few slides. But you can actually see several different isotopes listed here. Deuterium and tritium, we both mentioned, are heavy isotopes of hydrogen. Uh, we can see two uh, commonly used uh, isotopes of carbon, carbon-13 and carbon-14. Notably, deuterium and carbon-13 are actually not radioactive. And it's for a good reason, because deuterium and especially carbon-13 are more common in nature than you might assume, especially carbon-13. Carbon-13 actually accounts for about 1% of all naturally occurring carbon. So life on Earth would be kind of difficult if 1% of all the carbon around us was giving off radioactivity. Uh, so carbon-14, phosphorus-32, sulfur-35, iodine-131, radium-226. These are just some examples of different isotopes or radioisotopes in the case where you can actually see a particle energy uh, listed. But the point that we want to make here is that the isotope decays and the particles given off 
is something that you're going to want to be aware of when you're working with these particular radioisotopes. When you're working with a radioisotope, you want to be aware of what the potential risk is to you, how high the energy of the radioisotope you're working with, and then how long is that radioactivity going to be sticking around. If you're working with a radioisotope in the lab, you actually have to wait for the radioactivity to subside until you can go through the waste disposal process. So that's what the half-life terminology is in the rightmost part of this table. So let's talk a little bit about half-lives of radioisotopes. The half-life is actually something that does not ha actually have to specifically refer to a radioisotope. Any substance has a half-life which refers to the amount of time it takes for half of the current amount of that particular uh, substance to disappear over time. In the case of radioisotopes, we're talking about waiting how long does it take for 50% of that amount of radioactivity to disappear or decay over time. Half-life is something that can actually be fairly easily calculated according to this formula here where n sub t uh, is a function that tells us uh, how much of that particular amount of radioactivity is remaining. n0 refers to the initial amount of radioactivity that we started with, and we just multiply that times one half raised to this power, where the power is t, the time that is elapsed, divided by the defined half-life of the substance. So I'm not gonna actually have you do any of these calculations, but I will take you through a sample calculation on the next few slides. But the reason why, like I was saying on the previous slide, the reason why we want to be aware of this is because when it comes to working with radioact uh, radioactivity in the lab, we need to be aware for the sake of waste disposal, how long do we have to wait after we have finished our experiment before we can dispose of our radioisotope. So you need to know the half-life of a radioisotope that you are working with. Now, it's worth mentioning that it's not a guarantee that you're ever even going to work with radioactivity in the lab, but if you are, you're gonna go through training for your institution to train you on how to work with a particular radioisotope. And for that radioisotope, it's gonna be drilled into your head what the half-life of that particular isotope is. So it's something that you're gonna want to know. Okay, so let's do a sample calculation here. Let's work with tritium, hydrogen three. If the half-life of tritium is 12.3 years and we start with 100 curies, that's a unit of radioactivity, if we start with 100 curies worth of radioactivity of it, how much radioactivity will remain after 24.6 years? So I intentionally designed this problem so that the numbers will work out quite well. So again, the half-life, 12.3 years, refers to the amount of time it takes for half of the radioactivity to disappear. So after one half-life has passed, there should be half as much radioactivity left, 50 curies. However, this will now become our starting amount for the next half-life period. So what I do not want you to think is that if we wait another 12.3 years, there will, there will be no radioactivity left. That's not quite how it works. So every time a half-life passes, you lose 50% of what you had before. So if we wait another 12.3 years, meaning a total of 24.6 years, there should now be 25 curies worth of radioactivity left. Like I said, you may be tempted to say there is none left over, but that is not the case. So whatever the half-life is of your particular radioisotope, you need to wait several half-lives until there is an acceptable amount of radioactivity left. So if you're in the business of disposing of your radioisotope responsibly, you're probably going to want to pick a radioisotope that has a relatively short half-life. Now we can get to the same conclusion by using the formula that we introduced a few slides ago. If we just plug everything in, we want to calculate how much radioactivity is remaining after 24.6 years. That's gonna be n sub t, the function. N0, the starting amount of radioactivity is 100 curies. We multiply that by 0.5 raised to this power right here. 24.6 is t, 12.3 is the half-life t one half. So that should give us n sub t equals 100 times 0.5 raised to the second power. 
which plug that all in gives us the same answer that we got before. If we wait 24.6 years, there should be 25 curies left of radioactivity remaining. Okay, so we're winding down our discussion on radioisotopes, but this is a proteomics class. We are mostly going to be concerned with proteins. So how can we use radioactivity and radioisotopes in protein research? Well, I've got a couple of questions for you here. First, name for me all the different kinds of atoms that can be found in a particular protein that contains at least one of each of the 20 different amino acids. You can assume that there are no cofactors or coenzymes, no prosthetic groups or anything like that. Just a good old fashioned polypeptide that contains nothing but the 20 different amino acids. So you may want to pause the video at this point, go ahead and write down on a piece of paper all the different kinds of atoms or elements that can be found inside of a protein. Go ahead and pause the video now and then we'll reveal the answer when you come back. Okay, so now that you're back, let's talk about the different kinds of atoms that you can find in a protein. The answer is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. That's it. Those are the five different kinds of atoms that you can find in a protein. If you said phosphorus, you're probably misremembering that phosphorus is found in nucleotides. It's not found in amino acids, it's found in nucleotides. So if this was a question about DNA, you would just replace sulfur with phosphorus. Okay, so in a protein we can find carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. Okay, next question. A radioisotope of which of the above elements would be most useful in specifically studying proteins? So, you can use carbon radioisotopes, you can use hydrogen radioisotope, meaning tritium, there are oxygen radioisotopes, there are nitrogen radioisotopes, and then there's S35, which is the sulfur radioisotope. Which one of those radioisotopes do you think would be the most useful in specifically studying proteins and nothing else? Again, I'll pause for a minute while you come up with an answer, and then once you unpause the video, we'll reveal the answer. Okay, so you may have heard me mention this in a previous lecture, but the problem with using carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, or nitrogen radioisotopes is that those elements, especially carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, are all found in carbohydrates and lipids as well. So if we use carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen radioisotopes, we're not going to be able to distinguish between proteins, carbohydrates, or lipids, and especially not nucleic acids as well. Nucleic acids also contain nitrogen or phosphorus, so if we use a nitrogen radioisotope, we're not going to be able to distinguish between proteins and nucleic acids. So the clear answer here is going to be sulfur. Sulfur atoms are only found in proteins as far as cellular macromolecules go. You're not going to find sulfur in DNA, you're not going to find it in RNA, lipids, carbohydrates, none of them contain sulfur. You're only going to find sulfur in proteins, again, as far as those macromolecules go. We need to pick a radioisotope that will specifically label proteins and nothing else. All right, with that being said, I've got a final question for you, and this time I'm not going to reveal the answer to you. You're going to have to do this research on your own. If a protein is going to be labeled with S35, which is the sulfur radioisotope of choice, which amino acids must that protein contain? So, for example, if we're dealing with tyrosinase, the enzyme that we've been studying all semester, we need to look at the primary sequence and make sure that tyrosinase contains which amino acids? So basically I'm asking which amino acids actually contain sulfur. So make sure you look up the answer to that on your own, because I'm probably going to be asking come exam time. Okay, so as far as protein research goes with radioisotopes, let's talk about a couple of different techniques that we can use. The first are called in vitro transcription and translation systems, or TNT systems. These are kits that you can actually get from companies like ProMega, and basically, these are just lysates that come from rabbit reticulocytes. These are the premature precursors to red blood cells before they have actually ejected their nuclei. So these lysates actually end up containing all the machinery that are needed for the transcription and translation process. All you need to add to these mixtures are plasma DNA containing the gene that you want to turn into a protein. 
So if you have a plasma DNA that contains the gene for a protein that you want to make, the recombinant protein, you can just stick that plasmid into these master mixes and the master mix will make the protein for you. Now, what you can do here that's actually really slick is you can actually include one of those amino acids that I was asking you to look into, methionine, which is a sulfur-containing amino acid. If methionine is labeled beforehand with S35, you can actually follow the synthesis of your protein of interest in real time if you harvest a little bit of these lysates at different time points. Another type of experiment that we can do using radioactivity is called a pulse chase experiment. Now, you, in this case, you can use either S35 methionine or S35 cysteine. So there you go, I've already given away the answer to those, that question that I asked before. So if you use S35 methionine or S35 cysteine and you label a protein with it, this can be useful in determining the stability of a protein in the cell. In other words, we're asking the question, once we have labeled a particular protein, how long will that protein in the cell last before it is destroyed and replaced with new protein? In other words, how long does it take for the radioactive protein to go away and no longer be detectable? Now, some proteins in the cell are very unstable, meaning they only last for less than an hour before the cell destroys them using the ubiquitin proteasome system, which we've discussed in a previous lecture. And some cells are very stable, meaning that the cell keeps them around for days and days and days and days and never ends up destroying them until after a very long time. So the way something like this would work is that first you would add your labeled amino acids so that all new proteins in the cell are synthesized with radioactive amino acids incorporated. And then after you've given that a period of time to occur, you would replace the media on the cells. So that previous media is what we would call hot media because the media contains radioactivity. And you would replace the media with cold media, not literally cold media. Cold in this case is a terminology meaning that it lacks radioactivity. So this cold media would have no labeled amino acids. So now the cells in that media are going to start synthesizing proteins that are no longer radioactive. Your radioactive proteins are still there, but since no new proteins are being made that are radioactive, eventually the radioactivity is going to disappear. And proteins will disappear at different times depending on their stability in the cell. Another way you can do this if radioisotopes are not available, it's not quite as elegant a way of doing it, but you can actually treat the cells with a chemical called cyclohexamide, which is a poison that prevents the ribosomes from synthesizing new proteins. So if you stop all new protein synthesis in the cell, you can just do something like a Western blot to see when your particular protein goes away. So this actually gives you kind of an idea of how a pulse chase experiment works. You label all of the proteins in the cell, and if you've got a very stable protein, meaning a protein that doesn't get destroyed after very long, the radioactivity should actually stick around in the cell for quite a while. The little lightning bolt here referring to the radioactivity. Even after you chase the radioactivity out and you put the cold media on, the radioactivity should stick around for a while if you've got a very stable protein. If your protein's not very stable, after you pulse with the labeled amino acid, you initially label all of the protein with radioactivity. But if you're dealing with very unstable proteins, the radioactivity should quickly go away as the radioactive proteins are replaced with non-radioactive proteins. All right, so the last thing I wanna discuss is how radioactivity can be detected. The first and most common way in the laboratory is by use of what's called a liquid scintillation counter. This is a container that contains a solvent in which you add your radioactive substance to. The radioisotope transfers energy to the solvent, which then transfers energy to a fluorescent compound. And that fluorescent compound is something that can actually be detected. So what we're actually detecting here in kind of a roundabout way is the radioactivity. I won't go into much more detail than that, but that's essentially the way that it works.
And then for actually doing things like TNT and pulse chase experiments, you're probably going to want to use autoradiography, which is very similar to how we can detect uh, chemiluminescence given off by Western blot experiments. Essentially, you run your radioactive protein samples through an SDS page gel, you transfer to a Western blotting membrane, and then you expose the membrane to X-ray film. In this case, the, uh, the radioactivity exposes the membrane rather than uh, a secondary antibody. In this particular figure, we're looking at both a Kumasi stain gel and an autoradiography uh, picture here showing that the radioisotope P32, which was attached to the gamma position of an ATP molecule, we can actually see that this protein has become phosphorylated because we can actually pick up P32 radioactivity here. Notably, we do not see it in this lane right here because that protein was mutated such that the phosphorylation site no longer exists. Aspartate-1994, which is where that gamma phosphate was attached in the wild type protein, if we mutate that to an alanine residue, that phosphate can no longer be attached, so it makes sense that the radioactivity is no longer detected there for that particular protein. All right, so that's going to do it for this particular video. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, join us for the next video, and we will talk about the next topic, which is nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is much less of a headache than I'm making it out to be. Okay, see you next time, and so long.